Welcome to day 17 of the Course in Mastery. Today, Tom Wood is going to discuss the impact that your self-image has on your success and everything you do. Then Dr. Dennis Waitley is going to share the amazing thought patterns of a winner. Here's Tom. Thanks, Coral. Do you really want more success in life? Well, psychologists have shown that the one factor that determines success more than anything else is self-esteem. Self-esteem is the value you place on yourself. Someone with high self-esteem sees high value on themselves. And the most significant factor of people with high self-esteem is that they take responsibility. When they take responsibility, they notice their achievements and accomplishing things gives them higher self-esteem. It's a vicious cycle. How do you get on this upward spiral of responsibility, accomplishment, and self-esteem? Well, the truth is you're already on it. You just have to notice it. You have to notice that you do take responsibility in your life and you do have accomplishments. By noticing those two, it will give you more self-esteem. As you build that self-esteem, you'll start to take more responsibility and you'll start to have more accomplishments. It's real important that you focus your eyes, your ears, and your thoughts on what you currently already do well. You can also do this for your kids. Now realize that self-esteem does not come from praise. It comes from accomplishment. It comes from feeling that the praise is warranted. So don't just praise your kids. Give them challenges to overcome. And when they do overcome them, praise them for the challenges. And then also look honestly and directly at where they didn't accomplish and what they can do next time to improve. That honesty will give them self-esteem. My father knew that warranted praise from many sources from different people build self-esteem faster. So what he did was at the dinner table, he asked each person to go around the table and give praise to each other person. Well, he understood the value of self-esteem, but he forgot about kids. When it came to my turn, I looked at my sister and I said, Mary, your zits look great today and your dress is not as ugly as everybody at school says. <laughs> well, the great thing was that my dad never did that again at the dinner table and learned a really valuable lesson. Kids are mean. Remember, when you give praise, make sure it's warranted praise. And when your kids give praise, make sure they're giving warranted praise. One other strategy I have for building self-esteem, I learned by accident. I was having a great year. And in my journal, I wrote down all the great things that started happening to me. Now, a woman I was dating at the time picked up my journal and jokingly said, hey, can I read your journal? I didn't realize she was joking. And I said, yeah, sure, go ahead and read it. She said, are you serious? You'll let me read your journal? And I thought to myself, there's really nothing negative in that journal, nothing I wouldn't want anyone to know. What I realized is that journal had become a way for me to build my own self-esteem. I didn't even care if anybody else saw it. In fact, I was proud to show it to people. What I did from there was, every time I had a negative experience in my life, I would either write it down in a throwaway journal and throw it away eventually, and then put the problem and the solution in my journal, my journal of joy. So what I suggest is if you have a journal, create an incredible journal called your journal of joy. And if you have tough things to write down, write them down in throwaway journals. This will be your journal of self-esteem. You can look back at your life and say, man, what an amazing life I've had. That is something that you deserve. Do that today. Thanks for listening today. This was an important day for me, and I hope it was an important day for you. Here's Coral to introduce you to our expert today, and I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thanks, Tom. Today's expert, Dr. Dennis Waitley, is one of the most respected authors, keynote lecturers, and productivity consultants in the area of high-performance human achievement. He has counseled winners in a variety of fields, including Apollo astronauts, Super Bowl champions, and corporate executives, and for the last decade, has been responsible for performance enhancement of all U.S. Olympic athletes. In this next clip, Dennis shares the inspiring thought patterns of an Olympic athlete. Now think about this. These are the people who have become the best at what they do. It's incredibly eye-opening. I want you to think to yourself as you're watching this clip how you could apply the principles that he's discussing to your own life. Here's Dennis. 
A second Olympic ring is the ring of self-esteem or value. How much are you worth? Well, I don't have much now. Do you mean you have to wait till you perform in order to feel valuable? It's just the other way around. Performance is a reflection of value, not a measure of it. Winners believe in their dream when that's all they have to hang on to. And they believe they deserve to win in advance. Why? Because somebody had to come along and tell each of us, I see world-class potential in you. And if somebody who's an expert, an authority, someone you love, someone you trust, someone you believe in says, I see world-class potential in you, you begin to believe in your dream when that's all you've got. And you don't wait until you've made money in order to feel good. You don't wait till you perform. Your value is in the clay, not in the shape that it's taken. And of all the things I've learned, we have it all wrong. Children don't believe they're like their heroes or heroines because they haven't done anything very great yet, so they don't feel they're worth much. But the worth is in the uncut gemstone of the diamond inside. The acres of diamonds are in our mind. There is a diamond mine in your diamond mind. Value is inside, the deep down inside the skin feeling of your own worth. Given my parents and my background, I'm glad I'm me. I ain't the best looking in the group. I look my best in a group. And I may be old, but I can still do things, and I don't get sick, and I don't get mad, and I don't get tired. I just keep on trucking. Why? I like myself. I'm as good as the best, not better than the rest. And I still have plenty of time to achieve my own potential. Back in 1984, I can't believe it's been 20 years, Mary Lou Retton, red, white, and blue bodysuit, Los Angeles Olympics, 1984. Wow. There she was, 17 years old, 4 feet 10, little bundle of dynamite, blown out knee, no problem. Bella Carolee, the Romanian defecting coach. You're my little gold medal winner. This is your event, the vault. I'm sitting there as a sports psychologist saying, you can do it, Mary Lou. Only Nadia Comaneci is the only one that's had a perfect 10 up until you and no American gymnast woman has ever won a medal. Come on, Mary Lou. I wondered what she was thinking. What would I be thinking in her red, white, and blue bodysuit? Creeping up and back, <laughs> spandex, big hairy telephone pole legs, <sighs> getting sick to my stomach. <sighs> Thank God it's Friday. Don't work too hard. Can't get ahead anyway. Too much taxes, rotten government. <sighs> uh, why me, Lord? <sighs> Wish my parents weren't here. What a jinx. Romanians are better trained, probably on steroids. <sighs> here goes nothing. Break a leg. Why do people say break a leg when you go to do something? That's the worst thing you could ever tell somebody. That's like telling a young child, put your sweater on, don't get a cold, or telling a tight wire walker, windy day, no net, don't fall. <laughs> Give me a break. What was Mary Lou Retton thinking in her mind? What is it that goes through the mind of a champion? What is the self-talk, the psycholinguistics? the running commentary that you learn by listening to music, listening to lyrics, watching the scripts on television over and over, what do you learn that runs through your mind? There she is. <sighs> okay, relax, steady, <sighs> breathing, slow. Heart rate, slow and regular. <sighs> this is your moment in history. <sighs> Where's mom? Thanks for the carpools, mom. This vault for you, back to the runway. Speed, power, explode, extend, rotate, plant the feet at the end. When the pressure's on, I get better. Just like drill, come on, Mary Lou. Need a 10, got a 10. Let's go. Whew. Why would anyone ever tell themselves or anyone what they didn't want them to do? What was going wrong all the time? How can you possibly concentrate on the reverse of a message? It's not possible. You store the message so you can't tell people what not to do. In my opinion, the building of self-esteem starts very young as little infants and then toddlers. 
It starts with baby talk, with reading, with watching. Television is a one-eyed babysitter, and they watch and they process. The images flicker in subliminally, and the children are storing information. Self-awareness, open up. Self-esteem, let's get some inner value by talking ourselves up. I want to, I can, next time I'll get it right. Thank you. Always giving your hand, always looking people in the eye, always walking in as if you have something of value to give. And it's not doing high fives in the end zone. It isn't doing somersaults after every play. That's the arena, that's entertainment, fair enough. When you have high self-esteem, you can afford to be modest, and you usually are. You've got so much to offer that you're gracious. You sign for the fans. You always are there for them because they're the ones that made you. Instead of cavorting in front of them, you graciously thank them. Because if you got the real thing, you don't have to flaunt a loud, expensive imitation. Self-esteem is in the core, not in the skin-deep values. Tomorrow, we're going to look at the factor that's more important to your overall success than your intelligence. See you tomorrow.